Hi everybody, my name is Caden. I'm Jaden. I'm Eli. I'm Nicole. And I'm Jason. And we are on our YouTube channel. And Jason it is Shabbat. Shabbat. Yay! Yay! Thank you guys very, very much for spending time with our little family. Our family is your family. Your family is our family and we appreciate you all. We love you guys very, very much. And we thank you guys for being a part of our little itty bitty tiny ecclesia. And it is a Shabbat and is a day of rest. And I hope you guys all had a wonderful week. Let us begin with a quick word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another Shabbat. We thank you for another day that we can all be alive, that you can show us your awesomeness with your Torah, that you can show us your awesomeness with your amazing works, that you have just dis displayed everything to us. And Father, all we have to do is follow you. All we have to do is follow your son. And we, you have given us everything. Father, I ask that you will dwell with us today, that you will bring the Ruha HaKadosh, that we are able to be your people. You will, you will work with us in everything. Father, your creation cries out for you. Father, we crying out for our King, for our Messiah. We are we're looking forward to a day, a better day than the days in the world that we are in right now. Father, we ask that you will protect us and sanctify us and, and bring us into your spirit. And we thank you for all, Father. I, again, I thank you for this little ecclesia. I thank you that we have the ability to, to do this and for all the people that are out there. We thank you for all. We ask this in the name of Yahushua. Amen. Okay, and um, let us begin with something the Emissary of Elohim wanted us to do, which is the Shema. And so we are going to be reading the Shema. And Caden, are you ready? Yep. All right, let's do this. Hear, O Yashorel, Yahuwah Eloheinu. Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah Eloheka with all your heart, soul, and with all your might. That's it? That's it. All right, so that's the final piece of the Shema. It's, it's, uh, it's, it seemed kind of short. Do we have anything else? What is the Shema for those who do not know? What is What does it, it mean, a Shema? It's basically Yahuwah has to hear and obey. Hear and obey. What are we hearing and what are we obeying exactly? His laws. Whose laws? Yeah, who is laws? Okay. The Torah. And the Torah. How many how many laws do we have? 174 that we can keep. 174 that we can that we can keep. And why can't we keep the rest of them? Because they're basically like Levitical laws or laws that we cannot keep th to this day. Why not? Because there are no priests these days, and Yahushua is our Levitical priest. He is he our is, sacrificed lamb. He is our sacrificed lamb. All right. Well, um, that is good. Nicole, who do we have in the chat room? All right, so we had a gal in here before. I don't know where she went, but her name was Lena, I believe. And then we have Shalomith. Lester was here. I don't know if he's still here or not. Uh, Carla. Hi, Carla. Hi, Shaloma. Hi, Lester. Hi, brother, if you're still there. Much love to you, brother. The Grand. Our grandma's here. The Grandma's here. Emissary of Elohim. Yep. So the Shema was just so you have it now. Okay. <laughs> from this family. Zachariah Z and Rhiannon are here. Love that family. Love you guys. You guys have a beautiful family. He's such a, a, a awesome family. We love the support and love from the Zach and Rhiannon and little little um who, who are the who are the kids? Do we know the kids' names? The the, the girls. One of them is Damon. I don't know. I know Damon. What about oh, the girls? We don't, I don't know them. Anyway, much love to everybody. All all of you guys. Oh, and also Beth Yahudi. Okay. That's a new one from Caribbean. Caribbean. Awesome. Sweet. Caribbean. Car Caribbean, the Caribbean. Okay, well, let us begin with this. And what we are going to do, a little bit different here, but we are going to, um, what we did last week is we, we we are going to challenge those, anybody who does not want to cheat. And remember, folks, we have proper weights and measurements, which means you shouldn't cheat, which means you shouldn't look. And as we are, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how many of you guys can get as many commandments as you possibly can. And in the meantime, I, uh, I'm going to read a little bit out of um, a little bit out of Psalms 119 because Psalms 119 is a very, very great book, and I'm re reading this one out of the Sefer. And as you guys do it, last week is we kind of sprung this on everyone, so we only I think the 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 chat room only got like two or three, and so it was basically the chat room had two or three, and I think the boys ended up with four or five possibly. Um, we couldn't get beyond that, but let's begin here. And so in the chat room, if you guys can, anyone that's out there, type in any commands that you know of, of the commands that we can keep. It doesn't matter if they're from the beginning or the end. Let's see how many we can get as a team here. And I will start reading this as you guys are pu putting them in. I'm only going to read maybe 15, 20 verses on this, and then we will go and see if you guys um, are winners in the Torah 
uh, challenge. Okay, Aleph. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah. Blessed are they that guard his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to guard your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to guard your statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned your righteous judgments. I will guard your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Yahweh. Teach me your statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in your precepts and have respect unto your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and guard your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your Torah. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul breaks for longing that it has unto your judgments at all times. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. Gentlemen at this table right here, before I go into the chat room. Gentlemen in this table, what did I just read? What, what 20 verses did I just read? And what was the premise of these verses? So it's basically David saying, blessed are those who keep the commands, who walk perfect in those commands. Yeah, Psalms 119 is the, is the Torah chapter, right? It is all about the Torah. It is all about the law. It is about... Um, it's about what we need to be doing. And when we keep the Torah, when we hide this, one, one of these verses here, he says um, that I will hide it. I will, let's see, where I will meditate in your precepts. Where was this at? That I, right here. No, it's 20. Hide, hide not your commandments. No, that's not the one. I will hide my, in your hearts that I will not sin against you. Um, there it is right there. So one. 119.11 says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Guys, there's no way we're going to hide the word of our creator in our hearts unless we study this, unless we are reading it, unless we are thoroughly embracing ourselves into it. My friends, we need to bath ourselves in the Torah. We need to have this as our garments. They need to be our protection and they will protect us. And this is why we will read the, the, the Torah every Shabbat because that is what we should be doing because we will never hide this in our hearts unless we are keeping the Torah. You like, get us into our split screen. Actually, no, let's, um, let's go into real quick right here. And Nicole, what do we got? All right, so who, who Zach, do we have? Zachariah Z. Yep. He's number one again. He got be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. And his personal favorite is number seven, Master Sin. Master Sin. Carla got do not eat the blood. The grand says, Master Sin, be fruitful, honor parents, subdue the earth, do not eat the blood, don't cross dress, don't marry wife's sister. Carla says, do not under the, un uncover the family members. Yep. Very good. Awesome. You guys are rocking. Good job. Very, very, very good job. Okay. So, Nicole, I need to count on that, and then we will tally up this week and see how well you guys did. And thank you guys very much in the chat room for being part of this. What else you got? We have a new one. Oh, Abraham we have... Shalom. Abraham Shalom. And much... he says, do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Moloch, for you must not bring shame on the name of God. Yahuwah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um... Awesome. Well, good job, guys. Very, very, going. very good job. And they're still going? Oh, this God, is awesome. Do not prostitute. Do not prostitute. Emissary says, be kadosh. Be kadosh. Okay. All right. So we are going to start reading them. And guys, as we read them, um, gentlemen at this table, please go slowly and, and enunciate properly. These are, there is nothing better than these laws, statutes, and commands of our creator. There's nothing that we need to have more clear than what the laws, statutes, and commands of our creator are, because we live in a world where it is very unclear how we should be walking. And unless we have the Torah, we will be walking contrary to it. So good job, everybody in the chat room. Much love to you all. Be fruitful is commandment number one. Multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. 
have dominion over the fish, fowl, and every living creature. The herb bearing in every tree. Their own families. Master Sin. Master Sin, Zachariah's favorite one. Why, why do we want to master sin, guys? So uh, sin does not master us. If sin takes control of our lives, we become a slave to sin and we become a slave to death. And then we die the spiritual death. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, every, every clean moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Do not eat the blood. Walk before me and be perfect. Guard your who is covenant, laws, statutes, and commandments. 53 times, my friends. I'll say it. I'll say it every single week. There is no command. That is this long. If our creator did not want us to guard the covenants, he wouldn't have said this to us 53 times. Guarding the commandments does not mean that they end up on the cross or in the ditch or not part of our life. That means they are a part of our life. Every male shall be circumcised at eight days old. Teach your children the commands and guard the way of Yahuwah. Remember Yahuwah's name for all generations. Keep the Passover, the Pesach. Keep the feast of unleavened bread, matzah. There is one Torah over the stranger and the Hebrew. What does that mean, Jade? It means that everyone follows the same Torah. It doesn't matter where you're from, you all follow the exact same laws. Okay, so if that means if you are a Christian, would you have the same Torah as everyone else? If you want to be part of Israel, yes. Yes, yeah, there is one Torah. And this, you are, we are reading that one Torah, that one, that one set of guidelines that is the way to the kingdom. This is what we are reading, right? So, Sanctify all firstborn of Yahuwah. There are no mighty ones before Yahuwah. You shall not make even images. Do not bring Yahuwah's name to naught. Keep the Shabbat. Honor your parents. Do not kill. Do not break wedlock. Do not steal. Do not make false accusations against your neighbor. Do not covet anything of your neighbors. Do not make an altar from rock that a tool has touched. Do not go up to the altar by the steps. If a man steals cattle, he shall restore it five times. Yahuwah's laws for criminals. You shall stone the witches. Wizards and mediums. Do not lie with beasts. No sacrifices to other gods. Do not oppress the stranger, fatherless, or widow. Okay, what does that mean there? If we so let's let's look at a quick, um, I guess what we would call possibly an adjective, a descriptive word for our Creator. What is it? What does our Creator care about us, or what does he? What can we glean from the way he thinks when he tells us things like this? If we're not supposed to oppress a stranger the fatherless, or the widow. Who are those three kinds of people? Those people are people that are broken. Yahuwah loves the broken people because they rely on him. They, he is their, their provider. He is the people that provide for him. And when you are a person of Yah and you go and oppress any one of these people, you are doing opposite of what Yah has already planned to help them with. You are basically taking what Yah has given you and you are just shoving it back in his face saying, I don't care what you're giving me, I'm going to oppress this person. Yeah, and I would say there's probably a lot of times where you will walk past homeless people, and I would say at some points they may not be homeless. I would say they may be possibly an angel. It may be somebody that you would, if you encounter them, your life will change, and if you don't encounter them, expect not your life to change, right? They're, that is the people that we're never, ever supposed to leave, and we're not supposed to walk away from, and so sometimes we'll be tested. Sometimes there may be messengers of our creator that are dressed up in, in ways that we don't know, and they're testing us. They're showing us our heart. Okay, do not charge your brother interest. If you borrow your neighbor's raiment, return it to him before sunset. Do not curse the ruler of your people. Do not eat what is torn of any beast. Okay, uh, I just lost No my... false report. Thank you. Do not follow a multitude of evil. Do not judge unrighteously against the poor. Bring back your enemy's cattle if you find it going astray. Again, this is what this is stuff that our creator wants to do. Is the, the creator of the universe cares about your enemy's cattle. Can you can you imagine this, right? If you don't think our creator has his eye on absolutely everything we do, and things like this, if you would have an enemy and you see your enemy, you would more than likely want to leave his cattle away. You're not going to do it. But our creator, what is this saying about our creator and his love for animals or his love for humans or his love for like all of this, everything he has? I mean, our family ourselves, we love our animals, right? It breaks our hearts to lose an animal no matter what. And Yahuwah knows that things that break humans, things that need that it needs for help humans, like the Shabbat, he knows that's all helpful stuff. And he wants to make sure that his people aren't broken. He's like a, he's like a father, right? He doesn't want to see his kids sad. Yeah, things like that. absolutely. All right, help the animals of your enemy. Stay away from rumors and gossipers. Take no bribes. Do not oppress a stranger. Love the stranger. Give your land rest in the seventh year. 
Not mention any pagan names. Keep the feast of Yahuwah. Do not cook your goat in its mother's milk. Obey the messenger Yahuwah sends before you. Do not bow down to other Elohim. Serve Yahuwah. Make no covenant with other Elohim or outside of the land. Do not make or use this anointing oil on another person. That goes with the 58 too, and that's do not make or use this perfume on a normal person. And those were um, Kodesh style um, anointing oils or, or perfumes that they used in the temple and that we are not to make them as standard humans. Do not eat the fat. Do what you say you are going to do. Return what is your neighbor's. Obey Yahuwah's dietary laws. Woman's time of separation. Obey Yahuwah's hygiene laws. Keep the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim. Do not uncover the nakedness of your family. Do not take your woman's sister for wife. Do not lie with a woman in her uncleanness. You shall not sacrifice your children to Moloch. Do not be a sodomite. Be holy. Do not reap the corners of your field, or you shall not glean your vineyard. Do not deal falsely or defraud your neighbor. Do not lie or be a liar. Pay your workers for the day's wage they are due. Do not harm the disabled. Do not endanger your neighbor. Do not hate your brother. Rebuke your neighbor for his sin. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do not diverse your cattle. Do not mingle your seed. Do not mingle linen and wool unless you want a crazy vibrating effect that is not good for you. Do not lie with a taken woman. Do not eat the fruit of the trees for three years. Do not practice sorcery. Do not round your beard or the corners of your head. Okay. Do not... <laughs> Do not cut yourself for the dead. Do not get tattoos. Do not prostitute your daughter. Do not defile your temple. Do not consult the medium. Respect, respect, your, el oh, respect your elders. Have correct weights and measures. Do not walk in the manners of the nation. Keep the feast of first fruits. Shabuot. Okay. The Omer counts. I'm going back to 95. We are in the month of November. November has, what well, doesn't it have that uh, Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving, yes. yes. Thanksgiving. I haven't been in the States for so long. I, I keep forgetting. I think in November. If we celebrate Thanksgiving, are we walking in the manners of the nation? Yeah, uh, we're doing as the Babylonians do. Yeah. If you celebrate Christmas, you're walking in the manners of the nations. You know what the nations don't do is they actually don't keep the feasts of Yahuwah. That's what? how you can stay away from the manners of the nations. Okay, let's take this. What about Hanukkah? Uh, it's that, not biblical. That's not biblical at all. That is, so would we be walking in the ways of other nations? You're yeah. walking in ways of evil things. I mean, Hanukkah is rooted with evil. It's not even a thing of... Yahoo, and it's still around the same time as Christmas. He's just taking the stinky outhouse and painting it and saying it's something else. Yeah, it's like a super Christmas. Not only do you have one day that it's you get on your knees to the Nimrod tree and, um, you know, where he's, he's decored in gold and silver, but you have seven days of these and you get gifts every single day. It's like a super Christmas. It is not biblical. I mean, None it's of, even around the exact same time date as Christmas, and there's no there's no difference between besides it just goes on for seven more days. Yeah, and it's it is not it is not a biblical thing. Neither is is um, Thanksgiving. All of these things are part of the other nations. Okay, keep the feast of first fruits, Shavuot, and the Omer count. Keep the feast of trumpets, Yom Terah. Keep the feast of Sukkot, Shemni Atzeret. If you blast in the name of Yahuwah, you shall be put to death. If you kill your neighbor's animal, you must give him another. Repay injury for injury. Honor the Jubilee year. Confess your sins to Yahuwah and repay who you have trespassed against. The Torah of being a Nazir. Zizi on the four corners of your garment. Okay, what are Zizis? For anybody who's here that is new, what is a Zizi? Zizis are these blue strings tied up together. They can just be a single string, I assume, because we, we are not specifically told how we are supposed to make these. But we need to have a blue string dangled from the four corners of our sides to remember that we are his people, that we do not go astray. There's also a sign to the other nations that we are Yah's people. All right, do you have any chat room stuff? Um, we have somebody, Yah or a YouTube video, are these part of the 613 commands? And I said, no, these are the ones that we went through and found for ourselves. Emissary of Elohim says that 613 is the rabbinical list. Yep. Yeah. And they want to know, is it okay to follow that? So here's the thing is, is we went through the 613 laws, so-called laws of the Judaism guys. That was our very, one of our very first videos. In fact, a, a video that does really well on this channel is where we, I hate to say it, but we borrowed from another guy who was a, a and he just sped read through them, 613 of them. And when we went through them line by line, number one is you will find out there's not 613. They, I don't know who came up with this number. I don't know if they actually have a real list. Every single list that we found has repeats. It has duplicates. It has stuff like all over the place. And it is, if you are, you can keep the 613 laws as long as you don't get into Levitical stuff, although there aren't 613. 
we have it down to where we believe there are about 174 laws, but that doesn't include like the hygiene laws and the women's separation laws and things like that and the Levitical dietary laws either. Because if you want to take Leviticus 11 and that will break that down, you would have a bunch of different laws under it. But at the end of the day, the, the law is don't eat unclean food. Here's your list of clean food. Here's your list of unclean food. Um, so yeah, the 613 is, is all Judaism stuff. And you know, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. If you read that list, it doesn't make sense. If you go to our main website at Yahoo and the Torah.net, Y H W H A N D T H E T O R A H dot N E T. This same list that we are reading off is, uh, I don't know if it's a finalized list, but it is a list of us reading through and trying to grab every commandment that we can as, cl as closely as we can. I'm sure the list will change, but I think it's a much clearer list than the 613, if that helps everyone. Okay, um, Eli, on the wear seats on the four corners of your garments. Why don't Jews wear blue seats? Uh, one thing they said was because they don't have like the blue of the snail. That was like one of their reasons. And they're actually not in covenant with Yahuwah. Yeah. And so that is one important thing. Why are you laughing, Kate? I don't know. Blue of the snail. It's, it's, it's a squid, isn't it? It's a squid thought, or a snail like, or something. I thought they said it came from like some kind of blue snail. It's like a muscle of a snail, I think. Yeah. We had, a, we had a, a Jew guy that was um, a rabbi, a supposed rabbi that was a, a going at us. We were, we were discussing Messiah Yahushua. And again, for those who do not know who Messiah Yahushua is, that is who you guys know as Jesus the Christ. There were no j's in hebrew that letter did not even appear till the year 1524 and um it, it, he, he just wasn't there so we went back and forth with him on all of this stuff and um i don't even know where i was going with that where are we going with uh, this? the blue of the snail the blue of the snail that's right he told us the blue of the snail they, they eat chicken on passover instead of a lamb because for some reason and they wear white in their zit seats and that is not in covenant, right? That is outside of the covenant of our creator. Deuteronomy 4.2 tells us we cannot add to or take away to the Torah. So anything that is outside of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you can look at, and if you choose to follow it, that's fine. I mean, I guess that's fine, but that is you're adding to and taking away from it. And so if it's good recommendations that are good for life, sure, follow something. But if it's something that is bad or it, it, it makes the Torah bad, then ditch it, get rid of them and, and you know, go from there. Okay. Anything else? No, Chat room? Okay. The, 106. Yep. The laws of whoever touched the corpse. Follow Yahuwah's laws of inheritance. Torah of keeping your oath to Yahuwah. When in the land, the laws of murderers and, and victims' families. Do not add or take away from the word. Hear, 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 hear. Guard your soul. Learn to fear Yahuwah. You shall love Yahuwah with all your heart. Okay. Hold on. 112 says, learn to fear Yahuwah. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine verses there. Then it says, shall love Yahuwah with all your heart. One, two, three, four, five. And then it says, the next one says, bind the laws upon your hand and the frontlets of your eyes. We have that twice. It also says the next one, write the laws on your doorpost. That's in there twice. So we're supposed to love our creator. We're supposed to um, love him with all our heart. We're supposed to fear him. We're supposed to write these laws that we're reading here on our our on our hearts, on our minds, on our souls. What does this mean? How do we fear Yahuwah, anyone? You would fear him by obeying him, by respecting what he said. If you didn't care for what he said, you would live as you wanted. You would go eat your pork. You would basically do as you want, worship any day you want because you think you can. That's how you would not fear him. You would disrespect what he said. Do people that worship on Sunday as their Sabbath, are they fearing Yahuwah? No. Why? Because he said... His day that is holy, that is Kodesh, is the Shabbat, which is the day before. If you're going off and celebrating that, you are basically telling him, you don't care when his days are, you're going to celebrate when you feel like it, and it's up to me and not him. So the child who says, no, I'm going to do what I want when I feel like instead of you telling me when I, when I should do something. What about when you swear and you take the, the Father's name in vain? Is that fearing Yahuwah? No. That's not fearing Yahuwah. That is not his name, but people use that as his entity as his name most people know him as god so when you take his name like that you are disrespecting him it's like if you were to take out your parents and you say ah oh, curse this person and it's your parents that's just disrespectful to your person yeah you wouldn't use your mother's name as a curse word but yet you would use the creator of the heavens and earth as a curse word and you think that's okay all right let's continue on uh 115 write the laws on your doorposts do not tempt yahuwah do what is right and good in the sight of yahuwah do not be afraid of your enemies. Remember Yahuwah. Circumcise your heart. 
Cleave to Yahuwah. What does this mean? Whoa, whoa, whoa. We ha now we have this, this cleave to Yahuwah. We're supposed to, we're supposed to fear him, we're supposed to love him, and now we're supposed to cleave to him. What does this mean? You're supposed to desire Yahuwah. Your, your, your life should be to be with Yahuwah. It should be to appease Yahuwah. It should be to respect and fear him. He should be on your mind. He's your creator. He's the person you want to make happy the most of all people. And how do you how do we cleave to him? By desiring his word, by reading his word, by following his word with everything we have. Yeah, and I would also say we would cleave to Yahuwah by prayer. The more that we pray, the more that we are able to get into a prayer life with our creator, that we're able to talk to him on a, a basis where we just don't get lost in our prayers and go off thinking of those things. You know, that's where we're cleaving to our creator. Okay, swear by his name. Destroy graven images. Do not make an idol of Yahuwah as the pagans do to their Elohim. Rejoice in all Yahuwah has blessed you with. Do not do what is right in your own eyes. Do not hearken to the words of false prophets. Kill the false prophets and the little asterisk so it's in the land. <laughs> do not listen, turn away, do not listen and kill those that try to turn you away from Yahuwah, even if they are family members. We discuss this one a lot, and these are these are hard words to hear for people. And these are these are commandments that we cannot do in the world we live into. For you know, we according to the scriptures, we are at the end days, and we are the nations that have been dispersed. We are the people that have been dispersed amongst the nations. And you know, if if we were in the land, this is what our instructions would be. And so we need to understand this: that there may be a day that comes when we do make it back to the land, and these will still be our our things. And if somebody comes to you in the land and they say, "Hey, let's go serve. Let's go serve Hasatan." You, you pick up the rocks and you, you take care of that. Okay, if a city has turned away from Yahuwah, burn the city and kill all the inhabitants. Do not make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. You shall not eat any abominable thing. You shall give to a stranger of clean food that dies of itself, but you shall not eat of it. Give tithes your increase of seed year by year. Laws of the end of the seven-year release. Do not borrow from the nations. Do not harden your heart nor shut your hand from the poor. Guard month one of Yahuwah's calendar. Three times a year all males shall appear before Yahuwah. You shall make judges and officers in all your gates. Do not plant Asherah poles near the altar. And kill those trying to plant the Asherah poles. You shouldn't even have one. Nope. Any man or woman that has done wicked things in your gates, they shall be taken out and stoned. There must be two or three witnesses. Hearken unto the prophet Yahuwah has chosen. The prophet tested Deuteronomy. Do not remove your neighbor's property line. How to deal with a false witness among Torah keepers. The first child is to get double portions. Sorry, sorry, kid. The law of the wayward son, it's, uh, you'd stone him, but it's command for the land. If a man is hung to death, he shall not remain all night. If your brother's cattle or clothes are lost and you find them, you must return them. Okay, again, I want to, to bring this back to the things that concern our creator, right? You are so concerned with by our creator that he cares about your clothes or your raiment, things of that nature, right? That is how much your creator loves you. That is how much care and design he has gone into you. He didn't just design us and knows the number of our, our hairs on our head and intricately designed us into a beautiful fashion just so we can sit around and be cold, right? He, he cares about all of this, right? And he, this is what this is all about. These commandments are all about love. It's all about taking care of our neighbor. It's all about seeking our creator and getting close to him. Okay, a woman should not wear what pertains to a man, nor a man wear what pertains to a woman. Big if you no -no. find a bird's nest with the mother and babies or eggs, take the babies, but not the mother. If you build a new house with a flat roof that is able to be lived on, you must put a railing around it. Laws for the accuser and the accused in purity of relationships. If a man has a relationship with an engaged woman, both should be killed. If an engaged woman is raped, she is not charged with a crime, but the man shall die. If a man force himself upon an undefiled woman, he must pay the father and take her to be his wife. Do not be a prostitute. Do not use dirty money. And we have been going over this all week long with people that are using dirty money, and we are getting to the bottom of it. Okay. You may eat from your neighbor's vineyard or grain, but you may not take it out of the field. A lot of divorce. Newly married man should stay home for one year to be with his wife. Do not take a person's millstone for a pledge. When you do that, you are taking their livelihood. Again, our creator cares so much about what you have to eat, about so much about your life, about your raiment, and what keeps you alive, that he, he makes a command such as this so that if you had to 
do something where you had to give something up, you are they could not take your millstone for a pledge. This is straight up love from the Shimaim. Okay, if a man is found kidnapping, he shall die. If you lend your brother, do not enter into his house to get your payment. He must bring it to you. Return his clothing before sunset if thou was his pledge. Do not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Yes, and I want to stop and take a quick moment on here because there, you know, we, we I don't know if, we, if the word counseling or more than likely just having an ear to listen to is what we do, but we end up with a lot of people and a lot of people have a lot of problems. And one of the main, I guess one of the problems I, I've seen a lot of people take on is the guilt. A lot of people... And I'm not saying generational curses do not exist because I do believe they exist. And the generational curse can be something as picking up an alcoholic tendency from your parents or something of the sort. But there are a lot of people that are believing that they will be judged because of the actions of their father or the actions of their mother. And in the scriptures, it says that it will be a generational curse. There, there are generational curses such as this. But people that sit and live and dwell upon the crimes of their father or the crimes of the past, and they, they make that to feel themselves guilty, I don't believe this is what it is about. This is, why, this is why we have a choice and a chance. Now, if you are living a Torah-less life and you don't care about what the Torah is, then there's probably a good reason that you end up with a guilt. But if you are in Torah, if you have Messiah as the faith of Messiah and we have him in our lives... The past is the past, and there, it does us no good dwelling upon the past. It does us no good, which is why our Creator has told us to forgive everybody, even the people that abuse you and molest you, do evil, evil things that have changed your life forever. If you sit and harbor this, if you sit and hold on to this grudge, it only hurts your heart, it hurts your body, it hurts your senses, everything. And so if you are living a day-to-day -day life where you are feeling guilty for the sins of your parents, that is not what it says. And it says, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And there's also another command that says the mothers and fathers are not responsible for the sins of their children and the children are not responsible for the sins of their mothers. So we have to believe in the promises of the Torah and we have to free ourselves from that kind of guilt, okay? Oh, yeah. Do not go back for the forgotten sheaf in the field. Leave it for the stranger, fatherless and widow. You cannot give a man more than 40 stripes for his judgment of his wickedness. Do not muzzle your ox when he treads out the grain. If your brother dies and has no child, you shall take his wife and name the firstborn after your brother. If a woman comes to defend her man and grabs the other man's privates, you shall cut off her hand. At the end of seven years, you are to read the Torah at the Feast of Sukkot. And for those who've never heard the Law, Statutes, and Commands, 173 is an odd one. It is a, it has an asterisk by it. There is a lot of story to this one, and it's probably for another time. Some of these might feel weird. Some of them might feel odd to you. Um, but for the most part, these are awesome, awesome commands. All right, anything going on in the chat room? So the Grand just said about, like, the generational curses. Right. We should repent for, we should repent for them, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, the generational curse, I, I think a generational curse could be, I mean, it's even as much as probably swearing. I mean, I picked up swearing from my mother. And, um, you know, alcoholism for sure, drug abuse, things, all that, all that stuff can go on there. I mean, you can be the victim of child abuse and grow up and beat your kids, right? And that is a generational curse. Um, that's just the way it is. But we have to stop these generational curses. And you will never stop a generational curse until you understand what the Torah says. When we understand what the Torah says and how we should live, then we will not fall into these generational curses because the generational curses happen to our family members because the prior family is not in Torah. You have not raised the kids up right. You're not living right. Things of that nature, in my honest opinion. Okay, one more. One more. YouTube video says, can you explain Commandment 174? Commandment 174 is, at the end of seven years, you are to read the Torah at the Feast of Sukkot. All right, gentlemen, what All you right, got? so at, when the Israelites were all gathered together, as they do, that was one of the times they were supposed to appear before Yahuwah, they were all supposed to appear in Jerusalem, all the people, all the males of Israel, and someone was supposed to get up there, a person usually in charge was supposed to get up there, and they were all supposed to read the Torah basically as a remembrance to Yahuwah of what he did for the high brothers out of Egypt and what their commands are, so they don't forget it, because after seven years, if they didn't read it, they obviously went astray, they obviously forgot it, and this was just a remembrance thing, a thing of a celebration, kind of like a little uh, festival 
thing they had going on. Yeah, and that that's the thing is not everybody back in the day knew how to read. In fact, that was a lot of the jobs of the scribes and the, the pharisaical people that ended up being educated where a lot of the lay people, the common people, were not able to read, were not able to write, and things of that nature. And so if, if you did not sit and repeat this, if you did not, and most people did not have a Torah in their house, so they would not be able to just to go like we're doing right now. We are a blessed generation where not only do we have every version of, of the Torah out there, but we, we, we can sift through these lies. And so that is basically, it's a call to remembrance, and they would sit and do just like what we did today. And they would probably read it probably very thoroughly we read it in a condensed manner but it is as a reminder it is to write the the commandments on our doorposts on our hearts on our minds on our souls and the more that we repeat these commandments just hanging out here on shabbat the more that you repeat them the better equipped you are to deal with this world you will run into situations where all of a sudden you don't know what to do then you're like mm, commandment one one Commandment seven, I got a master sin. I should be involved in this stuff. I should not be doing this or anything of the sort. Kate, what'd you uh, have? An example we have of them actually doing this command is after uh, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and Ezra got up there and read the Torah to all the people and they all started weeping over yeah. it because it's like the first time they ever heard such a thing because it's been so long since they heard it. And Ezra's like, don't weep, rejoice. This yeah. is your Torah. This is your Elohim. And that was an example we have of him reading the Torah to all the people. Yeah, it is, it's beautiful. When the, when the people of that day, Nehemiah and Ezra's day, when they finally heard the Torah for the very first time, because they had been in captivity for a very long time, they sat and they just cried. They, they cried, and you would cry, because you realize all of a sudden that you have a big daddy in the sky somewhere in the Shaimaim, and he loves you, he cares about you, and he's given us a way forward. And without the way forward, we're just a bunch of lost sheep out there, and you know we're sitting there eating pig, and we shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so I guess that is it. Um, everybody, thank you guys very, very, very much for this. One more. What, there's a gal that just joined from Jamaica. Jamaica. Patsy. All right. Patsy, was it? Yep. Patsy? Patsy Hi, from Patsy. Jamaica. Hi, Patsy from Jamaica. And hi, everybody out there. If we missed you guys, much love to you guys out there. Okay, so let us begin. We are going to be reading in the bottom of this in what they call the Hallelujah Scriptures. And the Hallelujah Scriptures is available absolutely free of charge, free given, freely given, freely given back. So it has, um, you guys can download that on our website. It's right at the top of the website. Um, the top version that you're looking at here is called the Targums. It is called the Targums of Jerusalem. And we don't know if it's a great copy. We don't know if it's a bad copy. So far, the only problems that we have found in the Targums right out of the gate is that it brings in a tremendous amount of Babylonian month naming. And um, when you come up and you hear the word like Tammuz or Aviv, things of this nature. Our creator had month, he has days of the week, right? Day one, day two, day three. We're on day seven right now, the seventh day. The same for months. We have month one, month two, month three, month four. There were never any kind of names. And so when we see Babylonian influence, and that happens in the, in the scriptures that we read in the normal Bible, as well as this. So we just want to be very, um, very astute people that are reading this stuff. And so we will begin. Okay, everyone ready? Yep. Um, and so let me begin. We are reading the bottom of the scriptures. Top is Targums. Caden is reading from the Sefer. Jaden is reading from? Sefer. Sefer 2. Nicole is reading from the chat room. Actually, yeah, I was going to say, I don't have one today. Yeah, and so we're, we're device free. Okay, so here we go. At the bottom first. Chapter 9. And Elohim Barak Noach and his sons and said to them, Bear fruit and increase and fill the earth. And the fear of you... And the dread of you is on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the Shimaim, on all that creeps on the ground, and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they have been given. Okay, I'm going to stop right here because I, I read, I was reading this last night in, in Tim to this, and I found verse two very fascinating. Anyone else, anyone think, want to? Yeah, I was kind of curious about that too. Like everything should be scared of us. Yeah, every, and, and can we relate to this world? Is everything scared of humans? Um, yeah, we drive cattle we drive everything is runs away you, you go up to a cow it's just gonna run away you can't just go up to it i mean even dog i mean some dogs are gonna be angrier with you than normal but you do have the power over most animals i mean yeah and i mean absolutely everything can you imagine our world that we would have right now is if everything wasn't afraid of us we would be consumed we'd be completely consumed these things would be bold the lions would be taking out everybody more than they probably already do and this is very this is very interesting that our creator made us as the, the the strongest entities in the land. Okay, verse three. Eli, you here? Do we have... Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, let's go to the Targums at the top. 
and and Yahuwah blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, spread forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and on every fowl of the heavens of all that the earth swarmeth forth and all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. Every moving. OK, so then we're hitting back to the bottom right here. So we're on verse three and the Targums is kind of complex, but um, down here we are. Right here, I'll let Eli readjust the top. Okay, three. Every moving creature that lives is food for you. I have given you all and as the green plants. Okay, the Christians will stop right here and they will go, Jason, it just says that every moving creature that lives is food for us. That's what the scripture says. How do we debunk this when they're eating pork rinds and pork chops and bacon? How do we explain this to them that it does not mean every moving creature that lives is food well for them we already had from noah when he already went into the ark and it came by side by side he already defined what food was he already knew what food was designed for so he back then their diets here were mostly plant-based right until because there's no vegetation at this point because everything got wiped off the earth they had nothing to eat besides meat they had to eat meat to survive this was the only way till then they were basically on a vegan diet yeah, and it the one thing that most people don't understand is our creator has given us a dietary guide that describes what food is, and we don't have it yet. It's in Leviticus 11. In Leviticus 11, he breaks it down completely, but the people of old didn't eat unclean food. They, they knew about this. They, they definitely did not eat unclean food. So when it says every moving creature that lives is food for you, the number one thing is it has to be technically food. It, pig is not food. Um, a snake is not food that we can consume. Um, ducks are unclean foods, right? Those, those, are, those are things we, we shall not eat. Okay, four. But do not eat flesh with its life, its blood. With its life, its blood. Okay, so clearly it says right here that we are not to eat the blood, right? Yep. It says we can eat the meat, but it says we are not to eat the blood. And people will actually cook their steaks up and they will say they want them rare. And it's extremely pink. They are extremely bloody. And people love to eat the blood. Those aren't the only people that like to drink the blood. There's a whole group of people that worship Satan and they love drinking blood as well. It's they're part of their ritual. It's part of their religion. Okay, five. But only your blood for your lives I require. From the hand of every beast I require it. And from the hand of man... From the hand of every man's brother, I require the life of man. Okay, do you guys, just by what we read there, do you guys understand what that just said? Yeah, basically he's saying every man is their own life. If you take someone's life, he's going to require it of you. He's going to require your life of you. Say, that's kind of what I thought as well. And then I actually read the Targums, and it's a little bit different. So let's let's see what it says. You're on every. Every moving thing that which liveth to you shall be for food. But flesh which is torn of the living beast, the time the life is in it, or that torn from a slaughtered animal before all the breath has gone forth, you shall not eat. But the blood of your lives I will require of every animal which hath killed a man. I will require that it be put to death on his account. And from the hand of the human being, from the hand of the man who hath shed the blood of his brother, will I require the life of man. Okay, so did you guys catch that? What did that just said? So if an animal kills a man, then he'd be put to death. Yeah. It's, and it's, also a human as yeah, well. Essentially that, yeah. And I thought this was very interesting. Um, this is a little bit more. We don't have this stuff yet, right? It basically says that an animal, before it's breathed its last breath, even though it was it was torn by animals, if it's still alive, you could kill it, right? That And that's that would be food for you. But if it breathes its last breath, you shall not eat it, right? If it just takes its last breath. So th there's something about human anatomy, animal anatomy, things of this nature, right? We know that adrenaline causes us to, you know, we can we have flight or fight and we can do whatever. Our body drugs us when the time is needed that it will give us the excess energy. And it will also, when it's time to die, there will be different, um, I don't even know, chemicals, chemicals released and it will probably help us deal with death as well or, you know, at least, you know, that's that's the thing. And, and it's interesting that we can eat it up until its last breath, 
because you they could be torn to, to complete bits as long as it's still breathing. So that's something we never ever saw before. You're on verse six. Verse six on here. Yep. Right here. Okay. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood is shed. For in the image of Elohim has he made man. As for you, bear fruit and increase. Bring forth teemingly in the earth and increase it. Okay. And, uh, whoso. Okay. Whoso sheddeth the blood of man, the judges, by witnesses, shall condemn him unto death. But he who sheddeth it without witnesses, Yahuwah of the world will bring punishment on him in the day of the great judgment. Because in the image of Yahuwah, he made man. And you, spread yourselves abroad and multiply. Bring forth in the earth and increase in it. Okay. What do we, what are we making of this? Are you guys listening to the Targums? Are you guys yeah. catching this? Anything different? Yeah, we get to know that here we don't have this in the Sephora or any other version that you know, who will punish the person that sheds man's blood, right? And we only know that whoever sheds man's blood, he, he basically will have his blood shed and, for he's the image of Elohim. And judges and witnesses, they will uh, see them and they will condemn him to death. But if, some, but if it's without witnesses, that Yahuwah will uh, put that person to death. He will judge them. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting that our creator cares so much about his designs that there's certain rules of the game that we need to... Um, to, to have, and I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. Okay. You're on uh, Seven? Seven, eight. Eight. And Elohim spoke to Noach and to his sons with him saying, and I, and I see, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the birds of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And I shall establish my covenant with you and never again in all flesh cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again is there a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. I shall put my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Okay, do we need to read uh, it? Okay, have you go. Just okay. more. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. Okay, now we're at the targums at the top. And Yahuwah spake to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your children after you and with every living soul that is with you of birds and of cattle and of every beast of the earth that is with you of all that go forth from the ark of every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, and will not again cause all flesh to perish by the waters of a flood, and there shall not again be a flood to destroy the earth. And Yahuwah said, This is the sign of the covenant which I establish between my word and between you and every living soul that is with you unto the generations of the world. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of the covenant between my word and the earth. And it shall be that when I spread forth my glorious cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the daytime, while the sun is not sunk or hidden in a cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between my word and between you and every living soul of all flesh, that there shall not be the waters of a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of Yahuwah and every living soul of all flesh that is upon the earth. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I, what did you guys find? I find this very fast. I find so, the targums fascinating. I was pretty close to the same, except for the, we got towards the end, it says talking about the sun, how if the sun's not hidden, you'll see a rainbow. And that is true. Right, yeah, because the I mean, you, off water. Yeah, it, it, so this is, this is very interesting. So we have a world, we have a generation that has taken this rainbow. And instead of it being a covenant between our creator and mankind, they have made it, the the act of uh, sodomy, right? They have made it the 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 flag of sodomites, and um, you know you see it everywhere. Everybody's danced up in this rainbow. They they completely corrupted the bow that our Creator has put in in the sky. Um, any thoughts on this, guys? You guys have anything? Um, uh, I think that uh, it was definitely a covenant, and they've turned it into an abomination. Something that was very important, like especially in those times for those people. I think Noah would be very distraught if he saw what the rainbow had turned into now. Yeah, well, absolutely, right? It, it was something, 
it was a sign that he had just cleared off the wickedness and that he would never destroy us in such a fashion again, right? As little human beings, I believe that, I'll just go on to it. I believe that we are in a flat earth and that we are surrounded by ice walls. And I believe that when they fill up everything here, it would be like a giant pool and we'll all die, right? There's no, there's no, other, way, no other way around it. You can't, it's just... If he flooded us, it's a, it's a death, destruction. There's no way around this. And that's why it was talking about in the earlier chapters how it flooded above the mountaintops because there were probably people that had made it to the top of the mountains and they, they had to do it. So, all right. I think that's all I have on the cloud. Okay. Yep. 14. Yep. Uh, 15, right? Uh, no, 14. Yeah. 14. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud. And I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, I find this fascinating that Yah says he will see it, right? It's like people have said that we're, we're this little tiny world spinning around. There's billions of galaxies, billions of light years away. There's all this other kind of stuff. But yet scriptures tell us that our creator is able to see a rainbow and he's able to remember his covenant with this, which leads me to believe that he's not far away, that he, we are literally his footstool and that we are in a firmament, that there is a, our creator is looking in. And I believe that if the rest of the world knew that we weren't just this little random act of a spinning water ball and we're a bunch of monkeys, that they would come and they would see that Yah was was right there and they want to dwell with him instead of the evil of the, this whole world. Okay. And where are we at here? Uh, I think you're on 17. Okay. And Elohim said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shim, Cam and Yepeth. And Cam was the father of Canaan. Okay. Now we're heading back to the top, folks. And Yahuwah said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have covenanted between my word and between the flesh for all flesh that is up on the earth. Okay. Guys, we, we talk about this all the time. It says my word. It says, he is always saying my word, right? What does this mean? He says he covenanted between his word and between the word for all flesh that is up on the earth. No, he's saying his his Torah. He's made this covenant between them. I think here he's saying his word, right? He's literally saying it. I mean, he covenanted between his word. When he's talking, when he says it, that is the final thing. What he says is the word of Yah. When he gave us the laws, statutes, and commands, that was the word of Yah. And right here, he put he he put a covenant between his word and between the word for all flesh. That is between him and man. And I, I just think that's fascinating. And the sons of Noah who were, went forth from the ark were Shem, Cam, and Japheth. And Cham is the father of Canaan. Okay, now we are back to here. 19. 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and all the earth was overspread from them. And Noah, a man of the soil, began and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, this is interesting because if you plant a vineyard... You don't have grapes in the very first year. You don't have grapes in the second year. I mean, it takes a long time to grow a vineyard. You would not just plant a vineyard, which is very interesting because the only thing that we could conclude from this point right here is that he must have been here several years, right? So he was there several years. But then when we read the Targums, we find that is not true. So let's let's continue on here yeah, and then we'll get... I think you should read the rest of the chapter. Okay. And he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Cam... The father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Yepeth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. But their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed is Canaan. Let him become a servant of servants to his brothers. And he said, Baruch be Yahuwah the Elohim of Shem, and let Kenan become his servant. Let Elohim enlarge Yepeth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Kenan become his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, 
So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay, we're going to finish this up in the Targums at the top. These. These are the three sons of Noah, and from them were spread abroad to dwell in all the earth. And Noah began to be a man working in the earth. Now, the other translation where it says Jerusalem is a different type of this Targums. And Noah began to be a righteous man, and he planted a vineyard. This is the interesting part that I found intriguing. And he found a vine which the river had brought away from the Garden of Eden. And he planted it in a vineyard, and it flourished in a day. And his grapes became ripe, and he pressed them out. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he made himself naked in the midst of his tent. And Cam, the father of Canaan, beheld the nakedness of his father and showed to his brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a mantle and bare up it upon the shoulders of each and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned back and the nakedness of their father they did not behold. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew by the revelation of a dream what had been done to him by Cam, his son, who was inferior in worth on the account that he had not begotten a fourth son. And he said, Accursed is Canaan, who is his fourth son, a serving servant shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Yahuwah, the Elohim of Shem, whose work is righteousness, and therefore shall Canaan be servant unto him. Yahuwah shall beautify the borders of Japheth and his sons, and shall be proselyte, and dwell in the schools of Shem and Canaan, shall be a servant to them. And Noah lived after the deluge 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay, the intriguing part, right? The right grapevine up, came from Eden. The grapevine came from Eden. And so um, that's very interesting. And we know that Eden had good stuff. And this explains a tremendous amount of stuff. Um, it might have been like a super wine by the time Noah drank that. If it, yeah, because it's just like the uh, figs in Adam and Eve, when Satan planted them, they immediately sprung up became trees. They did. And so this was very interesting. What do you guys make of this? Also, what do you make of... Um, what do you make of this part right here about his fourth son? It's interesting that um, Ham was very angry with him for not having a fourth son. Ham was? Yeah, was it Ham that was angry? I don't remember. I don't remember that. Where did we figure that at? Right here, right? It was... He just said that he was inferior for not having yeah, a fourth son. Yeah, who, but who said that, though? Why did he see it said right there? What he had done to him by Cam, his son, who was inferior in worth on the account that he had not begotten a fourth son. Oh, maybe he's saying that the Ham didn't have a fourth son. Ham only we only know of Canaan, right? Uh, but he ends up having a whole bunch. He has a ton of kids. Yeah, he ends up having a lot. But what is this? What do we make of this part right here? Who was inferior in worth? Let me reread this. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew by the revelation of a dream. I also thought that was fascinating too, because I've always thought, well, this guy I was know. passed out cold. How did this guy know anything was going on? So anyway, he's having a um, I, I don't know a drunken stupor dream or something of the sort. And it was revealed to him, and there it is. So I don't know what to make of this. Does anyone have anyone in the chat room have any idea about the sons or why the fourth son would be this? If anyone in the chat room has this, I would be very impressed. I don't have the answer to that. So, um, brother Glenn just joined. Brother Glenn just joined. So maybe uh, brother Glenn, hey, we probably have to read this whole thing. We probably have to listen to this thing to get to where we are. But this is a question that maybe you can email me at some point. And I think this pretty much wraps up everything. Uh, gentlemen, do you have anything else for this chapter? Um, and no, I think it's just really interesting. I think that's why the Targum is so great is we get to know where a lot of things came from, like the vine that somehow came out of Eden, just came to him. And is this, uh, is that, that's a question. Is the Targums great or is this, is this some um, Jew based fairy tale that we're getting more stuff into this? Um, so I don't see anything wrong with uh, getting more details on this. I mean, there's nothing going against the Torah here. There's nothing going against the words other than we have the names of the pagan monks, but that is understandable. We have those in other Bibles, well, like the KJV. We get other pagan names like Jesus and God and a whole bunch of other crazy names in there, and people still follow that. And I think other than that, it's just it's just, well, so far so good. Jade, your thoughts? Uh, it was a really interesting chapter. Um, we have the rainbow for a reason. It's not for worldly desires. Yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think this is a. I have not found anything so far in the Targums that leads me to believe this is something other than 
<clears throat> it, the word of Yah that it gives us a few more adjectives and description stuff on this. Brother Glenn says, I was reading this just this morning and have to research a bit more because of a different renderings. Okay. Yeah. So, we, says, I don't know. Yeah. So we don't know either. Um, this is um, why we bring it before the assembly, the quorum, the ecclesia, and hopefully one of you guys can figure this out or we will study up on this if we can figure it out. But it's very, very interesting. So I guess. I um, have one more question that somebody, Daz, would like to know. Hi, I was just wondering why when Yeshua asked how to pray to God, he said to pray to Father, Abba, not Yahweh or Yehovah. Uh, let me, let okay. me go there. What, 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 what chapter we, that was? Oh, hold on. That's Matthew 7. Your mom makes your hands And then one other question why you guys are doing that says, what Torah version should we get to read? Um, which Torah version? Well, you can read the, uh, okay, so you're doing the first one? You're Are, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to find the Matthew one. Yeah. Okay, find the Matthew one. And which Torah version is the best? Well, it, it would be the one that we can understand the best and get the most out of, and the one that, that's the, the closest. I, I don't think the King James Version is the best Torah. I like the Hallelujah Scriptures. Um, I've been reading more into the ISR, and I've actually talked to the guy who's on the ISR team. And I'm extremely impressed with Mr. Bill Meyer. I think he is, um, he's, he's an older gentleman and I was, I'm late to the game and all of this stuff, but I got to, to have a good solid meeting with him and another gentleman. And we were discussing all about this stuff. And um, I think every one of these Bible, I don't say Bible vendors or Bible translators, they're all going to say their scriptures are the absolute best. Um, I still, I'm probably going to, I, it's probably between the Hallelujah Scriptures and the ISR is the versions that I would pick if you're reading this and trying to get to the, the very bottom of things. And so that would be what I would try. And you could definitely try it. Read the Hallelujah Scriptures. You can download that on our website. It is definitely there. It's, a, it's the entire PDF. And um, you can click, for those who, who want to try it, when you download the PDF and you get to the part where it gives you the books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, you can click on either side. You can click to the right or you can click to the left and it will take you right to that book. And um, I guess the best version of a place to start with is the version you read first. Whatever the version is, when you start with the Torah, and I, I hope and I pray that when you guys start reading the Torah that you guys will fall in love with it, just like we did. We fell completely in love with the Torah. We had no idea there were laws. We were Christians. We did what we wanted. We ate what we wanted. We celebrated when we wanted. We did everything when we wanted it. And when we found out there was actually a, a set of, of laws that people have, you know, they've gone and they've said, oh, these laws, they're too hard. Jason, nobody can keep the laws of God. That's actually a, a lie. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Everybody who chooses to keep the laws, statutes, and commands can keep them. And when they say it's a burden, I would have to say that is also a lie. It is more of a burden to fall into sin. It is more of a burden eating unclean foods and getting sick and dying. It is more of a burden doing evil things. And you don't know what evil things are unless you read the Torah. It is so... It is so uncomplex compared to what people have made it. And, you know, we went over the laws, statutes, and commands this morning, and that's it. That's that's the, the taboo laws of God that nobody wants to keep, that everyone says you don't have to keep. But if that is true, and it says don't uncover the nakedness of our family, then if you're saying the laws of God are no more, you could be a pedophile, and that would be okay. And it's not, right? That is, There's nothing good with that. So if you don't keep the laws of God, that... By default, that makes you an evil person because you will do evil things. So, anything else in there? No, just the one from Daz. Daz, what did you guys figure out? So, here he says, when you, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, who established Yeshua in the heavens, exalted is your name. So, he refers to him as our Father. And I think when, I, when you're praying, you're meant to have like a conversation, right? It's a personal relationship thing. When you're talking to y'all. Yeah. So what was the question it's exactly? Like Zachariah Z says, I don't call my dad Derek. I say dad. Yeah. So read that she's question. Just wondering, just wondering why when Yeshua asked how to pray to God, he said pray to the Father Abba, not Yahuwah. Yeah, I mean that that's that's the less I mean, that's what it says. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And yeah, this is like a personal relationship. That is a an intro into a prayer. Should that be the only prayer that we ever have? No, because if we just have that prayer, it's a vain repetition. It goes over and over and over. We could memorize that and say it over and over and over. But when we are praying, 
you are talking to our creator just like you're talking to your spouse or to your wife, to a friend. You're talking to him like a person who understands and who knows all of this. Even though you may not get a direct reply back, there is another side that is listening. And so it is about a constant communication and however you start, Father, Yah, um, you know, our precious Heavenly Father, however it is you start, that is the intro. And it's not going to be the, the standards of how you start. It's going to be the content of what you are speaking. It's going to be how your heart is, your attention span to that prayer and, you know, keeping in it and continuing on in prayer. So um, I don't think it's bad if we say, yeah, our, our father, Yahuwah, or, you know, how it is. It, it was it was an example. And if that's where we begin with the example, that is that's a great example. So hopefully that answers everything. Okay, everybody in the chat room, um, we have much love for you guys, and um, it is one of those days. We, we get the rest of the day to relax and to be with our creator and to read his word, and thank you guys very, very, very much for hanging out with us. And Eli, what in exit song will we have? Is there anything else? Anyone? Um, I don't think so. What you no. doing there, Eli? Right, All right. Ready? Make it happen. Yeah. All right. Much love, everyone.
Bye. Much love, everybody. Much love.